Okay, I copied for, for you on, on the chat also uh, the link for the YouTube streaming of this session. I take this, uh, this occasion to, to remember to all the participants, listener and, and, and presenter that uh, uh, to ask for the floor and uh, take uh, uh, for question, you have to write in the chat after the presentation. And uh, we have uh, 15 minutes for the keynote after five minutes of question time and for regular um, contribution, five minutes uh, for the speaker and five minutes for the questions. Okay, here we are. So, yeah. so I can start. So we can start, yes, of course. Uh, I am Amedeo Manuel Bertetto. I'm from, from Politecnico di Torino, and I'm the chairman of this uh, last session uh, of IWSS. And I am very honored to introduce and to present uh, uh, Professor Lagaros. Professor Lagros uh, is the Dean of the School of Civil Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens. He uh, is also an Associate Professor in the Institute of Structural Analysis of Anti-Seismic Research in the School of the same university. And is the Director of the National Computers Laboratory in the same university. Uh, in the past, he also served as a visiting professor a Department of Biological Engineering and so on in the USA and also in Canada. Professor Lagros is an active member of the Computational Mechanics Research Community, uh, focusing uh, on a study like nonlinear dynamics analysis of concrete and steel structure, structural design optimization, self computing, soft computing structural engineering fragility evaluation of reinforced concrete and steel structure, inverse problems in structural dynamics, and so on. Uh, his publication track record includes more than 135 peer-reviewed journal paper, 10 books, and 25 book chapters. Uh, here we have uh, our contribution uh, of our keynote that is entitled Topology optimization driven conceptual design of structure. Well, Professor Lagaros, it's my pleasure, please. Thank you very much for a nice uh, introduction. You're welcome, Professor. Uh, as you said, uh, the subject uh, that I will present to you is topology optimization driven architectural design of structures. And I would also like to present uh, the two students of mine, Stefan Sudroblos and Jorgos uh, Kazakis, that uh, actually carried out uh, the, the runs that uh, developed the uh, uh, code required for the things that I will present you. Uh, my presentation will be composed by two parts. First part will be about the subject design based on uh, prefabricated structural elements, uh, which be, will be followed by, by the formulation, solution, and uh, some text examples. And uh, then conceptual design based on uh, 1D structural elements. Composite optimization have been used a lot in uh, aerospace engineering and uh, mechanical engineering. And uh, recently, it's been used 
uh, in uh, architectural design and uh, civil engineering structures. You see in uh, these figures uh, some uh, first uh, attempts to to use the policy optimization for designing either uh, shelters or uh, bridges, as you see in this slide. The formulation of the optimization problem of the topology optimization problem. Uh, the basic formulation uh, is uh, to minimize the objective function where uh, in uh, topology optimization represented by the compliance of the structure. In the basic optimization formulation, we have some equality, inequality, or uh, box constraints. The corresponding constraints used in the formulation of the topological optimization problem are related to the, to the volume but uh, is introduced based uh, on the volume fraction that uh, we need to, uh, to comply with in the final design. In the formulation that I will present you in the first part of the study, we introduce a modified formulation of the topology optimization problem, where instead of assigning in the find elements specific volume fraction, in the new formulation, we assign different structural shapes, different structural elements that compose the structural uh, the structural component of the whole structure. So again, in the formulation that I'm presenting you here, we have the compliance of the objective function to be minimized, but, but instead of using the, 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 the volume of each structural element to be the design variable, we have the corresponding structural element that will be assigned in this find element. In each element, we assign a predefined shape that I will present you later. Here, here we have some indications of the predefined shapes that are assigned in the locations in the basic formulation of the topological measurement problem, we were assigning the, the different values of uh, uh, the material uh, volume. In the formulation that I'm presenting you, we are using Q4 find elements, where uh, four nodes are, uh, are used. And, uh, we assign in these locations a different type of shapes. We have here a, a pool of 10 uh, different uh, star-like uh, shapes, but uh, this is not uh, a restriction. We can uh, use any type of uh, shapes that can be uh, introduced in this four in this four node Q4 uh, element. For uh, introducing these different uh, shapes, we use an unstructured un unstructured mesh generation in its uh, shape. That's uh, for example that that three elements. And uh, we assemble the global different matrix of this structure that uh, represents the, the specific uh, shape. 
at the, by means of static uh, condensation, we generate an equivalent Q4 element that corresponds to the star-like uh, shape structure, star-like structural element. By means of regression analysis, we derive the values of the stiffness coefficients of the stiffness matrix of these equivalent finite elements, these equivalent Q4 of finite elements. By, by, doing, by doing this, during the optimization procedure, we generate values for each location of the for for, for this this for, for this uh, uh, initial fine element discretization where we assign these structural elements and we define in its shape in, in, in each step of the optimization procedure which shape corresponds to which uh, find element. We are using OC algorithm for solving this problem. And uh, this is the, the difference of the uh, original version of the topological measure formulation versus the uh, present to one. Uh, the difference is that is that uh, at the beginning we need to to, to design and uh, generate the equivalent find elements, the equivalent Q4 find elements by means of static uh, condensation and uh, regression analysis and integrate these uh, the, the results of these procedures in the topological procedure. Some uh, first 2D test cases, uh, you see initial design, uh, design domain, the, the result obtained by means of the classical topology optimization. At the, on the right, we, we have the, the resultant of the proposed new formulation of the topology optimization procedure. You see on the classical topology optimization, you, there, there are, there are uh, void elements on the initial structured fine element discretization, while in the proposed formulation, there are no void uh, locations. There is a distribution of the various uh, shapes that I showed you earlier. This is a second test example. Uh, again, we have the classical topological measurement, the proposed one. You see the difference in the optimization, uh, optimal design uh, achieved. We have also used in uh, 3D shape structures, uh, uh, cell structures, uh, where uh, we are also assigning in uh, this quadrilateral elements this uh, uh, shaped star shaped uh, structures, star shaped uh, structural elements. And uh, you see here some uh, examples of uh, plate up type uh, of structures. The type, uh, type of uh, you see the type of the loading and the 
support conditions and uh, resulted uh, optimal designs. We have uh, translated the resultant of the optimization procedure in uh, Grasshopper. And, uh, you see here the variability of the star-like of uh, the star-like uh, structural elements that are assigning to different locations of the initial discretization. You see here uh, different type of uh, star-like structural elements that uh, have been uh, distributed. Also in, in, in the second test example, and also in uh, the, the case of the cell type of uh, structures. And, uh, some perspective uh, views of, uh, of these uh, optimized designs. Uh, I will go uh, through it also in the, uh, in, the, in the last part of my presentation where uh, a discrete approach of the topology optimization is uh, presented. Uh, one D elements uh, are used. Uh, the discrete approach optimization is divided in two stages. Uh, we have the generation of the initial design domain, uh, and then we have the mathematical formulation of the problem. Uh, we're using GarsCopper plugin in order to, to generate the initial design domain. And uh, the topology optimization, the on 1D uh, based on the fine element topology optimization procedure is uh, carried out, where uh, subsequently the resultant of this, of this optimization procedure is uh, introduced in uh, sub-2000 in, in order to uh, justify the uh, the, the, the design checks of the design codes. Uh, by means, as I said before, uh, by means of uh, Grasshopper Rhino, we uh, generate the initial uh, domain, the connectivity of uh, the nodes with the, 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 the possible con connectivity of the nodes uh, by, means, uh, by means of one D elements. Again, the formulation uh, is based on uh, compliance. Uh, where is the objective function to be minimized? And, uh, there is a constraint concerning the volume fraction that uh, is to be uh, uh, assigned in the optimized design. Uh, uh, actually, the the one D topological optimization procedure is uh, a module of uh, the high performance topological optimization computing platform that uh, have been it has been developed in uh, our group uh, that is based uh, both in MATLAB and uh, uh, C -sharp, uh, languages. I will go through this examples in order to show some uh, results. Uh, for the case of the 2D case studies, uh, on the left uh, we have the initial uh, design domain, and uh, by means of uh, topology optimization, one D topology optimization, we obtain these two optimized designs uh, varying uh, resulted uh, as a variance of the uh, formulation of the, of the problem. Uh, in the first case, uh, a lower volume fraction is uh, 
uh, required were uh, in the right one, a um, larger one. Well, uh, in the second case, uh, we have a full ground structure where uh, a full connectivity of all nodes uh, is uh, is used as uh, a basic uh, design domain. At the, on the left, you see the uh, different design different designs that uh, are achieved. Uh, a second type of uh, uh, structure is uh, uh, you can see here uh, the, the simple case of the current structure, the full case of the current structure at the different optimized design that, uh, that uh, are achieved. Uh, also, an, another type of uh, the, the test example, the, the bridge test example, where the distributed loading is uh, applied uh, at the top edge of this uh, design domain. And uh, you also you can also see the different designs achieved uh, through the, these two formal formulations. You can also see here some uh, 3D test examples. The 3D can, de can deliver a case at the designs achieved. At the case of the grid cell, uh, grid cell structure at the different uh, designs optimized designs achieved for the case of one load at the middle of the cell or five uh, loads. This is another formulation for the case of uh, frame type of uh, structures. Uh, here the measures of procedure is also uh, integrated with uh, with SAP, here you can see the, the result of the design of uh, SAP 2000. At the concluding, uh, I can say that uh, the poll's optimization can be used uh, as a basis for uh, designing of uh, structural shapes and uh, also structural systems that also will also comply with uh, the, 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 the design uh, regulations and the design codes. Uh, that's for, uh, for now, if you have uh, any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor, for, for the nice presentation. I'm very, very rich of, of, a, lot, of a lot of example, and uh, you presented um, an original method, really. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, uh, from uh, Stefano. Please, Stefano. Uh, Thank you, Professor Lagaros. Very interesting presentation and very complicated numerical approach. And I, I had a question about the title of the presentation because in your title you have uh, conceptual design. And uh, of course, in this kind of, of uh, problems, you can expect that you have multiple solutions. So, uh, in terms of conceptual design, how can you then uh, try to select one of these solutions? Is mm -hmm. so the, the, uh, uh, yes. uh, thank you for your question. 
by generating, by, by, by let's say applying different type of uh, loads or uh, using different type of uh, support conditions, you can generate by means of uh, this procedure, different uh, structural systems. But uh, can be uh, conceptual design, uh, let's say, approach. Uh, for selecting which one is uh, the best uh, for us, it's uh, up to the engineer to, to, uh, to, to choose uh, which one uh, fits uh, best uh, to his problem. Okay. Okay. Any other question for our keynote speaker in this session? Okay, I, I have, uh, I think, a very quick question. Um, if you make a, a comparison, Professor, between uh, a traditional method of optimization and, uh, and the one that, that you propose, you have uh, an actual uh, reduction in the consumption of the material. You, you have shown, for example, the cantilever system, no? Uh, if you make a, a comparison, you, you have um, um, a reduction in terms of percentage of, of material between the two optimization. Actually, it, it is a different approach. Uh, you predefine the material volume that uh, you want to assign to your structure. And uh, through this procedure, you, you need to achieve the best distribution of this uh, material volume. Mm -hmm. uh, the other approach is uh, you want to minimize the material uh, requirements uh, for your uh, design. This is another approach. Yes, of course. So, so we, we, we would like to derive the best, let's say, structural system this is where conceptual design is uh, introduced, but uh, will uh, uh, comply both uh, with the design codes and the uh, material requirements. And in the case of structures subjected to uh, different main condition of loading configuration, you have to uh, define a configuration that is uh, uh, um, uh, between the, the main configuration, of course. Uh, well, uh, you, you can uh, either introduce some of the uh, design combinations and design loads in the procedure uh, that I, I have present you in the procedure of the on, on, in the conceptual design procedure, or uh, use loading loading as uh, uh, as a means to generate different uh, structural systems, and then the structural system that uh, was uh, generated through this procedure to be designed based on the design codes and the design loads that uh, are, are, uh, are, are applied by the design codes and uh, derive the final uh, construction, final design. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have a question again from uh, Professor Senatore, please. Professor. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nikos. Uh, it's, um... The was a conscious choice to have an analysis in the procedure instead of doing simultaneous analysis and design. I know I noticed that in the first uh, formulation you proposed, this U is obtained by inverting the stiffness, and I was wondering why you left that as an analysis procedure instead of having U as a variable, instead of having the displacement field as a variable. Um, so nested analysis versus simultaneous analysis and design. Uh, 
Uh, we are talking about the the first part or the second part or both. Uh, in both, first. actually, I've seen that you uh, you don't actually treat the some of the state variables are three the state variables. They're never part of the design variables. Yes, uh, why it's a conscious choice, right? I guess you know. Yes, in, 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 in my in my second part of my presentation, the one D based uh, topology optimization, we have uh, introduced some type of uh, design checks in the topology optimization procedure, right. but the major uh, design part was uh, implemented after the optimization procedure. Uh, this was uh, due to the fact that, as I told you before, we would, would like to use this procedure as a conceptual design procedure, meaning to, to, to derive the, the type of the structural system and then design it. Mm -hmm. Okay both for uh, the star-like uh, structural system, structural elements that I showed you in the first part, and the 1D elements that I showed you in the second part. Okay. Well, uh, now for the, for the very last question, I have to give the floor to Francesco for, 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 the, for the last question. Please, Francesco, okay. torna bene. Uh, only, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, only a curiosity, Professor Lagar. Um, um, you uh, talk about um, uh, grid shells uh, in a part of your presentations. So I want to know if you use uh, an homogenization to trade these kind of uh, structures or uh, you optimize a system of beams. So uh, I want to know if you have uh, a, a model uh, for the optimization of uh, grid shells. Uh, we, were, we were based on uh, grid cells, not not uh, on the elements. On, on grid cells, we we used for the, yes. Uh, yes. And you homogenize or directly? No, 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 no homogenization. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we can uh, uh, move on uh, with the first uh, regular speaker. Thank you so much again uh, to our keynote. Uh, we move on with the first regular speaker of this session, Professor Tornabene. Yes. Uh, you can start with your presentation, please. Okay. You see my desktop? Yes, we see it. Very well. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. I will present uh, an higher order mechanical modeling of laminated and lattice composite shells with a complex material and geometry. This is uh, a work uh, um, due uh, with my colleague, Rosanna Dimitri. So, uh, I show you a brief uh, outline. So I will uh, try, uh, try to uh, speak about uh, composite and uh, laminated shells. And uh, I speak about uh, a numerical method to solve these kind of structures and uh, a numerical implementations. And I present also uh, a strong formulation and weak formulation to treat uh, these kind of uh, structures and some applications. Here you can find uh, uh, the main bibliography, all the results that I will uh, present uh, in uh, this present during this presentation. You can find in this book, and uh, due to the fact that uh, I have no uh, more time to present uh, all the aspects of this of this research. I want to um, present uh, you uh, the software that I use to obtain this kind of results. So uh, regarding all the theory that I use to obtain my results, uh, you can um, refer to the uh, presentation that uh, uh, will be uh, that uh, has been uploaded to the site. And then I want to show you 
the software that I use to obtain these results. So this software is based on differential quadrature and in particular, um, this software traits the uh, shell structures. And uh, um, uh, with this software that is built in software using MATLAB, uh, we can consider different kind of uh, theoretical approach to uh, study this kind of structures. And in particular, for example, we can to start for the simple first order shear deformation theory. So here you can see, for example, the parameter that you need to study this kind of structure. Excuse me, Francesco, you, you are sharing the PowerPoint, not the software. Yeah. Eh? Ah You're yes, you do, not, you, do not, you do not see my the, the, the software. The software, yes, you should share the software. Only the slide. Eh? the slide. is about the software, but uh, I don't know if you are. Sure. But you, you see the so no no but because uh, the software is important because I want to show you uh, the the way I used to obtain this kind of uh, but I, I, I think that you have to to share uh, the entire screen if you want to to ah, okay okay you do not see do you, you do not see the screen oh, I understand only the PowerPoint oh, only oh, only the PowerPoint we see you, you you see only the PowerPoint now yes okay. No, but they want to eh, show this screen. Okay. Now you see the software. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, yes, excuse no. me. Excuse me. Because because uh, I don't uh, I don't see that uh, I share uh, only the PowerPoint. Excuse me. And okay. this is also your beautiful uh, desktop. <laughs> Lord, Lord Thank of you, the shells. Okay. And uh, in this kind of uh, software, I want to show you the, the way of treat this kind of models and uh, the simple way to consider higher order mechanical model to uh, treat uh, the um, shell structures. So for example, we can consider first order shear deformation theory. So it's a simple theory that you well known. And then you can consider all the other theory, for example, a simple AD zeta four. In particular, in this uh, theory, we can consider 80, uh, 18 parameters. And uh, for example, the Murakami function that, con that, con that allow us to consider the zigzag effect. So you can choose also uh, the shear function. So for example, for each, uh, column of this model, you can consider different kind of theoretical thickness function. For example, Levi-Stein to the T and Ferreira sinusoidal function and, 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 so, and so other. So you, you can change the theory using different kind of theory for each degrees of freedom you want to consider and use. You can skip also from the equivalent single layer to the layer wise approach by using this simple uh, box. And then also for this kind of approach, you can consider, for example, uh, many degrees of freedom, in particular, higher order theory, also for the layer wise approach. And you can consider also different kind of formulation. So you can solve the equation of motion, for example, for this kind of structure using a strong formulation or a weak formulation. So it depends on the way you want to solve this kind of equation or using differential quadrature method or using a general integral quadrature method. So you can skip through this two formulation by using this, uh, um, this button. And then when you have uh, um, considered the theory, you can skip to the material. So in the material, you can, for example, consider a three layer structures, in particular, three layers, in this case, orthotropic layers. And then, for example, using uh, um, this software, you can consider also uh, the fiber reinforcers uh, laminates, 
with uh, the oriented fiber along uh, the shells. And this is important because when you uh, evaluate the stiffness of the uh, that you use in the equation, you have to evaluate point by point. So the mechanical properties of the shells varying along the surface of, uh, of the shells. And so you can uh, do this choice by varying, for example, the parameter you can you, you use to obtain uh, this kind of trace of the oriented fiber, for example, that one. Okay, this is a representation of the um, curvilinear fiber along the um, curvilinear uh, lines of the shells. So this is uh, for an example that you can uh, solve with this software. Okay, when mm -hmm. you have defined the material, you can use the geom you can define the geometry. Okay, for example, um, a more simple geometry that you can study, for example, a surface of revolution, in particular, for example, a catenary, uh, a shell of revolution using a catenary meridian, and we can obtain this kind of structures, okay? And uh, in this uh, part of the software, you can introduce the geometric parameter that uh, allow you to, uh, to discretize the uh, geometry, not only in the uh, B-dimensional or two-dimensional direction, so in the shell direction, but also in the normal direction. So you can see, for example, the complete, re complete 3D shell structures. So in this case, uh, I increase the, uh, the thickness and you can see, for example, that uh, uh, we have three kind of layer in this, uh, uh, in this um, kind of shells. But when you use, uh, for example- Francesco, sorry, uh, I, I have yeah. to say you sorry uh, because we, we have to, to respect the time. It's, it's very impressive, really. Very fascinating. Yes, yeah. I, I, I skip directly. I skip directly to the results. Okay, okay. because it's important uh, to yeah. understand the result that we can obtain. Okay, and uh, for example, I already run some of the uh, result that we can uh, um, we can see. For example, in this case, I study a three-layered shells. And uh, uh, in particular, this is uh, a ellipse, uh, elliptical shape sh shells. And I cut this shell using uh, a circle eh, in, the, the curvilinear, the, in the curvilinear shells, bidimensional shells. So for example, I show you the mode shapes in this case. So with this approach, I can study very, um, very interesting and uh, arbitrary shaped shells. And then I can obtain results using higher order formulation, using different kind of material along the, uh, the, the shell surface. And, uh, and this is important because it's not easy to, um, to consider that the material varying along the surface um, in, uh, and we, because we have to consider also not only the variation of the material point by point, but also the variation of the derivative of this, of this material point by point. So this is an important feature that with this software, it is possible to consider. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. All the, all the things that uh, you want to uh, learn about uh, uh, the theory, about the material, about uh, the result, you can, find, you can uh, uh, refer to the material I upload to the, um, the site online. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesco. Sorry that I, I, I tried to stop you, but uh, it's the time that, uh, that uh, gives yes. me... Uh, only, no worry. only a curiosity if there are not questions and I ask to, to answer very fast. Uh, is it possible uh, yes. to model also a pierced vault or pierced shell on, on, on the software that you made? 
pierced vault i i mean uh, i don't with hole with uh, with different holes in the surface yes okay yes 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 okay i have a slide for example yes this is uh, um, a a feature a future because i want to um, implement so um, at the moment i cannot consider in this software um, vault or shells uh, with the hole and discontinuities but in the future i want to um, expand the software in order to trade these, these cases. Because uh, as you see in this slide, it is possible to consider. And uh, it's only uh, the step that uh, um, it's important to implement is the assembly. Assembly of uh, each part of, uh, of the shells, so each element. But it is completely possible because if I can trade an arbitrary shells, I can also consider um, the combination and uh, uh, I can consider this kind of structure by implementing the, um, the, the, the condition between each element. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for uh, your presentation. We, we have to, to move on to the next one. Uh, I have, I have uh, here uh, Dr. Eroglu and Professor Ruta, and the title of the presentation is uh, Non-Trivial Fundamental Path Band Buckling of Damaged Parabolic Arches. Well, the presenter is Dr. Eroglu, of course. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we hear you very well. Okay, okay, thank you. So I will start right away. Well, by the way, I must say that it is quite a nice uh, organization to be a part of, so thank you for having me, by the way, I must say that. All right, we, let me go to full screen if I can. And maybe I arrange a laser pointer, okay. We basically deal with uh, stability of arches with uh, concentrated damages, which may be uh, transverse cracks for continuous beams or rods, you may say, or uh, a failure of connection members in larger structures. I will introduce the arch model we used very briefly and how we, how we model the damage and then provide simple numerical, numerical example. And I will uh, talk on it. We assume the arch is uh, one dimensional continuum with parabolic axis. These are basically the earlier in description of uh, kinematics and balance. We assume the arch is of course, it is flexible, and in addition to that, it is uh, extensible and uh, shearable according to the Meshanko model. Those were the field equations in finite form. We uh, provide a linearization of those finite form equations about the reference configuration, which is free of any stress. And this linearization by perturbation approach provides uh, the very well known linear differential equation system of Kurt Rhodes, uh, obviously. We will use it to determine the fundamental path. We then uh, perform another uh, linearization, but this time about a pre-stressed and deformed configuration, which is basically a generic point on the fundamental path. Uh, some of, by the way, uh, the subscript F refers to fundamental path, but of course these are linearized uh, approximations of the field functions of the fundamental path, I must say. You can show that under uh, suitable uh, assumptions, we can uh, recover a very well-known uh, equation. For example, if you neglect the, the deformations of fundamental path, and if you k the curvature is equal to zero, you will end up with Euler column buckling equations. And if you assume k is equal to one over r and it is constant, then you'll end up uh, with Mariot equations for circular arches. These are the non-dimensional quantities, but to be honest, only uh, when commenting on the results, these two will uh, be of importance. The parameter alpha uh, defines the initial configuration or initial, initial geometry of the uh, parabolic arch and lambda here is a measure of uh, its slenderness. The resulting equation system is uh, of variable coefficient. It is homogeneous for bifurcated path and it is non-homogeneous for the fundamental path. The solution to both uh, are known in terms of 
a matrix called fundamental matrix or transfer matrix or metricant, whatever you uh, may want to call it. It is, uh, it can be written by means of the matrix capital Y, let us say. For a fundamental path, Y of F, we can determine this fundamental matrix exactly, but for a bifurcated path, uh, we make use of some approximate uh, solution technique, which uses panel series expansion. And this procedure leads to um, a modified version of Volterra's multiplicative integral. To model damages, we use spring analogy. We assume the crack is uh, open all the times, which can be debated, of course. Uh, we use spring analogy to examine the effects of damages on global behavior. With this model, uh, the interactions, as you may see in here, the interactions are equal to each other at crack section, of course, after suitable projection, as you may see in here. But there will be a jump in deflection components. There will be, a, say, a relative strain, you, you may say, a relative uh, deflection, you may say. And this relative motion is quantified by the compliance matrix and interactions at the cross section. And this a compliance matrix is derived, derived by means of the energy release rate, a concept of linear elastic friction mechanics and Castigliano's first theorem. Each term in this compliance matrix refers to certain mode of relative motion. Of course, this is a compliance matrix and you may see some set of springs here. Uh, so basically the stiffnesses of these springs will be quantified by the inverse of this matrix but then again, it is easier to uh, somehow show the relative motion and which component is responsible for those relative motions. I will very briefly highlight. The tricky part is off diagonal terms. Here CNM, C of NM describes the axial displacement due to bending couple and CMN provides the relative rotation due to axial force and we make use of a parameter, a non-material parameter P to describe the crack location on this section. When P is equal to one, the crack is on top, we say. And when uh, P is equal to minus one, the crack is on the bottom of the section. Therefore, positive axial force will uh, lead to different uh, rotations. This is the numerical, exam numerical example we consider, we consider parabolic arch with fixed ends under a uniform line load of magnitude Q. Uh, the geometry varies from a real shallow one to a moderately shallow one. And we assume that the crack is located at XC is equal to 0.25. By the way, this is the origin and this is equal to X is equal to one. Of course, the non-dimensional version of it. We assume that crack might be on XC is equal to 0.25 or equal to 0.5. We always assume that lambda is equal to 80. This is a relative crack depth. Uh, we assume that the arch has rectangular cross section uh, and the crack is, uh, the depth of the crack is half of the height of the cross section. The time is, is over, Urgukan. Okay, the conclusions. Very well, thank you so much. Well, these are the interactions of fundamental path. We see the thrust follows the bending couple when P is equal to one, it increases its magnitude. And when P is equal to minus one, it decreases its magnitude since M is negative. A similar pattern is observed when uh, XC is 0.5. But here we see when P is equal to one, the thrust is almost unchanged because the uh, bending couple is practically zero there. These are the critical loads, critical load ratios, critical load of uh, cracked arch to that of intact one. We see that higher thrust leads, leads to uh, a lower buckling load, but we see something in contrast in here. This is one of the last uh, slides of mine. This is the reason. The incremental bending couple and axial force admit opposite signs for the incremental uh, behavior. Uh, when P is equal to one, the axial force decreases the relative rotation at correct section, providing a stiffening, increases the buckling load therefore. When P is equal to minus one, the incremental axis load further bends the chunks, and this increases the local compliance and leads to bifurcation at an earlier stage. These are some 
key points, of course, there's a lot more to comment, but time is uh, quite limited, it seems. So on behalf of Giuseppe Ruta of uh, Sapienza Universa di Roma, a Kremtufekci of Istanbul Technical University, I, Uja Nerolu of Izmir Economy University, see, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Urgukan, and please give my, my greetings to, to Giuseppe. Uh, sure. very, very nice presentation. Uh, are there uh, any questions about this, uh, this topic, this paper? Uh, no question. Uh, I have a, a quick question. Uh, I want to ask you if it's possible uh, to consider also uh, a geometrical imperfection of the arch together with the crack presence. And the second one that is connected, if it's possible to consider uh, not only one discontinuity, but uh, for example, a, a crack pattern on the arch. Yes, I mean, let me start with your last question. In fact, it is of course possible and uh, we provide a, an iterative procedure to deal with uh, multiple cracks and I had provided some references to it. Yes, in, 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 I'm not sure if you can see it. And in this article, you may find a, an iterative procedure to deal with multiple cracks, obviously. As per in, in imperfection, I think it will have more impact when the arch is shallow because then there might be the possibility of um, symmetric loss of instability and skew symmetric loss of instability. And at that time, I mean, in, when, when the arch is shallow enough, then there might be the uh, impact of imperfection. I mean, we, we haven't dealt with that, but when the arch is quite shallow, then the imperfection will play a greater role, obviously. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very welcome. Question? Okay. Thank you again, Jurgu Khan, for your presentation and for your hands first. Uh, the next one, please, uh, Professor Senatore is here. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, you can share the screen yes, I will. and start your presentation. The title of the work of Professor Senatore is uh, Extended Integrated Force Method for the Analysis of Pre-Stressed Stable Statistical and uh, Statically determined and in the sorry, structure. determined structures. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so this is a new force method. Uh, we believe it's the first force method fully automated that can uh, predict uh, the response of kinematically indeterminate systems, which are those systems that contain mechanisms uh, and largely speaking, uh, cable net uh, tensegrity or systems like the one shown in the picture. Um, Existing force method, they are not fully automated. And in comparison to the better known stiffness method, which can deal with such systems, the method that we propose offers a deeper insight into the response of the structures because it decouples the extensional from the inextensional part due to the mechanism modes. Uh, an important assumption is that the mechanism are first order infinitesimal. So that means that when the mechanism is displaced, uh, there is no first order deformation of the element, hence we call them inextensional. But second order changes might indeed occur. Um, briefly, the existing integrative force method, which is based on equilibrium equation and compatibility through the self-state self stress uh, uh, states, uh, which can be obtained by singular value decomposition of the equilibrium matrix, and, uh, and there is also this quantity we need to you know, keep our attention on, which is the mechanism mode, which is the left new space. What happens with these equations, when the load lies in this space, there is no solution to the equilibrium equation, um, simply because I think this example is effective if, if, if the load is oriented in this direction, the vertical, and there is no pre-stress in these two members, then uh, the uh, classic equilibrium equation, they just break. So the total displacement cannot be uniquely determined solely through the element forces. And this is happens when the load lies in the left uh, new space of the equilibrium matrix, which is that UM. So what we did is to uh, introduce the concept of product force, which was first introduced by Pellegrino and Caladine, is to use this concept. So the product force is basically the unbalanced force that arises as the mechanism is displaced due to the element pre-stress. 
So as the, as the, the, as the element reorienting space, because they are pre-stressed, even if there is a components of load that excite the mechanisms, due to the pre-stress and the, and the reorientation of the elements, there is an unbalanced force that can actually equilibrate the mechanism. So uh, the product force can be used uh, in a procedure that we propose, uh, which, uh, which, which aims at obtaining the appropriate pre-stress they can stabilize all the mechanism in the system. And this is done by making sure that the, this, this quantity, which is basically the, com the, the product or the product force or the unbalanced forces times the mechanism modes is always a positive definite uh, entry. So this matrix is a positive definite matrix. And we solve this problem through semi-definite programming, which produces a global optimum through interior primal dual, uh, through, through, through primal dual interior point algorithm. And the, the point to uh, keep our attention on is that through this method, we obtain the pre-stress that guarantees that all mechanisms in the system have positive stiffness. That's the main concept is like through pre-stress, we can stabilize the mechanism. And once they are stabilized, then we can obtain a solution in terms of forces and displacement. Interestingly, we also include the so-called eigenstrain in the uh, design variables. The, the eigenstrain can be thought of as the uh, initial element deformation. So if you think of a structure that you need to change the length of the elements such that a change of shape stabilizes the, the system. Uh, we, we use this concept of eigenstrain in active control where the, instead of modeling the imperfection, we model the length of the change of length of actuators that are embedded in structures. So we use the same idea here. Once, once the product force is obtained, then it's relatively easy to extend the uh, existing IFM equilibrium equation so that the primary unknown becomes the internal forces that the coefficient of the mechanism modes, whereby we can obtain the extensional part of the displacement caused by the load and the mechanism. And the extensional part is simply obtained by using the orthogonality between the product force and the extensional displacement. This method is fully automated, so it is equivalent to the better known stiffness method. Uh, They're both polynomial third order, but our method, well, the IFME, gives a deeper insight because it also gives you the extensional part of the mechanism. Why you want to know that is because when you apply pre-stress, it can tell you how much you are, how much stiffness you are imparting to the mechanism through the pre-stress. So it's an important quantity. Uh, time is running out, but if I have one more minute, I'll show you one, two case studies. Uh, good comparison with analytical solution. We overestimate uh, the displacement, which is conservative because we underestimate the stiffness of the mechanism due to the first order infinitesimal assumption. For more complex structures like this triplet and secretary towers, it's interesting to see that we obtain uh, the extensional and the inextensional part, which is even more uh, obvious in this case. We have like a simple cross-bracing system with two actuators. In this case, the pre-stress is directly imparted through length of change of the actuators. If the load, oh. the orthogonal, um, uh, applied in the orthogonal uh, plane and the outer plane determine a displacement of 20 millimeter by applying uh, uh, um, a further change of length, then we can half the uh, uh, inextensional displacement. So this shows you directly what effect has uh, further pre-stress has on the st stabilization on the mechanisms. Uh, and here we close with the uh, uh, leaving the conclusion open to questions if there is any. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor Senatore, for the nice presentation. Uh, are there any questions, please? Okay, uh, Stefano, uh, have a question? Please, Stefano. Yes, here. Okay, sorry. I was muted, sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Gennaro. It's, uh, it's ever really interesting. So uh, uh, just a, um, a clarification about the matrix G. Mm -hmm. Is the matrix G dependent on, on the actual configuration? And uh, yeah. it, 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 how, do you, how do you manage with this uh, in the algorithm? And, uh, and, 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 and another question, did you try to compare some solution with, with uh, some 
kind of approaches like uh, Rick's approach or yeah, okay. Uh, this kind of algorithm, uh, path following approaches. Sure. So the first question about what G is, so G, you can think of G as kind of the stiffness of the mechanism in, uh, in a way, you see, so the delta A is the, is, the, is the change of orientation of the elements. And then WS is the uh, state of self-stress and alpha is a coefficient. So this products WS times A is effectively the pre-stress. So when you, so there exist M product forces if there are M mechanism in the structure. And the M mechanism of the structures are given by the mechanism modes that you obtain from singular value of the decomposition. So this is linear, you know, so this is a linear method. Yeah, so it's not non-linear, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a relative of the, what we can call in other methods, uh, geometrical the, stiffness. The geom is, is very, is very, it's similar to the, to the geometric stiffness. That would be the equivalent if you use the stiffness method, yes. So if you use the stiffness method, the, you build the geometric stiffness matrix. But if you use the force method, you use, or at least we, we use the concept of the product force. Okay, so it, they, are, they are related, but they're not identical. Um, um, you, you can show that the product force is in fact, is the projection on the mechanism space of the geometric stiffness matrix, but they're not, they're not, they're not identical. So the important part is that uh, how to deal with it. Like, so if you ensure that this, uh, product is supposed to be definite, then it means that you are uh, applying a pre-stress that can stabilize all mechanism in the system. And so um, you obtain, you build G, the matrix G through as a result of, of the solution of this uh, semi-definite programming problem. And once G is obtained, so this, this problem basically tells you also if the structure is pre-stress stable. So if there is a solution to this problem, because it is a global optimum, then it, 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 it is a confirmation that the structure can be stabilized indeed through pre-stress, because not all kinematically indeterminate system can be stabilized. But if there is a solution, it means that the structure is pre-stress stable, so-called pre-stress stable. Uh, and so you can then continue uh, with the augmented equilibrium and compatibility equation to obtain forces and displacement. Okay, thank you. The second question is that we, we, we do not compare with nonlinear methods because, well, we compare with nonlinear method for some example, and the answer, if I remember correctly, is pretty close that we pro provide, this work is published in the International Journal of Solid Structures, so you can find that in there. It was like a, it was like a less than 10% different to nonlinear method, but it's good to remember that this is a linear method, yeah. So like, it's not, it does not iterate uh, through, you know, a configuration of, of equilibrium is a one-step procedure in, in, if you, if you want to call it that way. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Gennaro. Oh. More clear now. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, uh, um, Professor Senatore. Uh, unfortunately, we have no time for any other question. Uh, thank you so much again for your important contribution. Thank you. Uh, well, now, uh, the next one, uh, please, Professor Schultz, Joshua Schultz. Good morning. Uh, OK, uh, sorry. Gennaro, you uh, have to, to unscreen. Pardon? One second, uh, Joshua. Thank you. OK, Joshua, you, you, can, uh, you can share your screen. Perfect. Uh, Professor Schultz, uh, um, Dicone and Co. Analytical model for phi PLY cross laminated timber. Please. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon or good morning from you know the west coast of the U.S. here. Um, so, what I'd like to do here today, in the the relatively short amount of time that I have, is rather than focus on all the details of the actual derivation of the model, which are in the paper, and I'd be happy to talk about, I'd rather talk about the context and the motivation for what we're doing here. So the, the real impetus for this is coming out of a partnership with industry. So it started probably 
uh, eight years ago while working at SOM on the Timber Tower. And then most recently it's been um, developed in partnership with some of our local cross laminated timber or CLT manufacturers located in Washington. So I'll be presenting on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Deshaun and Cope here. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, cross laminated timber is effectively a, a composite structure uh, where the uh, inner layers are uh, orthogonal, laid up orthogonally to the, the other layers. And so oftentimes what you have are you have three, five, seven, nine ply um, structures. And so coming up with a, a series of design equations specifically for designers. So we're not looking for complicated numerical methods. Um, what we're looking for are initial design equations that we can give to designers to improve our designs and, and give reduced um, material usage here. So what, what really spawned this um, was the idea that uh, there's a real lack of design methods for pr practitioners regarding CLT panels. And that's important even at the lowest level because if you look at a, a building, um, as soon as you go over, you know, three or four stories, up to 40% of your structural system is going to be in the floors and up to 70% of that structural system for high rise. So you can make a lot of gains materially if we can dial in our efficiency on the thickness of those laminates um, or the, the different overall composition of those. So what we did here, and I just wanna walk you through this briefly is this idea using some of the basics of um, engineering. So if we look at the difference of, between concrete and CLT, and then if we look at the impact of our boundary conditions, that'll show you why we're focusing ultimately on a five layer composite beam model um, rather than a, a shell or a plate model for now. So if we look at a concrete model and we end up with a simply supported beam uh, or, or rather, I should say a one-way slab that we can model as a simply supported beam. Uh, everyone here, I think, has a good grasp that obviously your deflections are going to be significantly larger. And so what you can see right here on the screen is that what governs your, your design is actually designing for deflection. So you're stiffness driven. Whereas if we can move to a fixity, um, that boundary condition addresses our stiffness consideration. And now we're designing in the, in the strength realm. And so if you look at that, right, uh, this is a, a good example we always use in class. You have the ruler, you apply the load, you get a deflection, you clamp that, that fixity moves us from designing based on stiffness to moving us over to designing for strength. So that's a wonderful thing. So we thought we would take that approach for CLT. Um, but what we find when we move over to CLT is that there are material um, limitations. So CLT, uh, when we're pinned, we're, we're in a vibration and or deflection realm, depending on where you're at. And so these are all for equivalent loads and spans and things like that. Um, and when we move to our fixity, what we end up with is uh, the reality that fundamentally this is a, uh, a wood product. And so the way we design these wood products, of course, is that um, mass timber is remarkably resilient to fire. But the way we deal with that is that as fire is introduced, you end up charring those bottom layers. And so just intuitively, if you end up charring your longitudinal layers, even if you don't burn into that second layer, that second layer is a transverse layer. So effectively what you do is when you introduce a two hour, two hour fire rating to a CLT material, you move from a five ply to a three ply. And so what that effectively does is now my design is driven by the post fire strength of a five ply being equal to a three ply. And so the, the thought is that in this very specific scenario, if we can get additional strength out of the CLT, I can move from being governed by a post fire strength design to an actual service design. And so now we're not taking an unnecessary penalty associated with the CLT product. So real quickly here, and we can talk about this. Um, it's a pretty straightforward layup, no pun intended there. Um, we've got a five ply, uh, we're using a composite uh, layering. So plane sections remain plane. Um, and that's for each element, but not for the overall unit. So we're allowing those individual layers to rotate. What we're doing effectively is we're saying that these longitudinal layers here in the white are taking all of our axial uh, tension and compression, uh, or the preponderance of it at least. And then these inner layers here, these transverse plies, are taking the shear. And so what we're doing is we're using a, a composite model and we're setting that up in terms of our strain energies. We're taking the variations for that. We're you know, simplifying that all out through calculus. 
through a whole bunch of bi-algebraic manipulation, we can end up with uh, deriving the axial forces in each one of those plies. Once you have the axial forces, you can work those back into your overall displacements. And then what's valuable for the designer is we can take those displacements, convert those into um, our stresses. And now I can give uh, the designer a, a closed form solution um, for the stresses at each one of the inner layers of these plies. So what we've done right now is we've taken that and we've uh, accomplished that for a uh, simply supported and for a fixed uh, system. Now what we're doing is we're taking those series of relatively complicated closed form solutions and we're doing a series of best fits so designers can kind of plug and chug through those. Um, and then we have a, just gobs of three, five, and seven ply experimental data that we've been fitting to to make sure that we have um, accuracy in our results. Um, so with that, what we're going to do is we're going to deliver those best fit design equations for actual uh, designers um, using that five ply model. Um, and then eventually there's some, some in, uh, desire there to, to expand that to some post tensioning for a project we've got going on in Oregon here. Um, so that, that, that really is the overview, the context and the motivation here. I did my best to try to keep it within the time, which is the, always a challenge here. Um, what I wanted to do is just give everyone on the call um, sort of the context and the motivation, and I'd really welcome any additional thoughts here. If you have questions about the math, I'm happy to talk about that. I can talk about uh, variational calculus uh, probably longer than anyone wants to listen. So um, that's, that's the overall thrust. And at this point, uh, I just want to thank you for your time and for this opportunity and then welcome any questions. Well, thank you so much, Joshua, for, for the fascinating presentation. And are there any, any questions uh, for this paper from the audience? No question, I, I, uh, I have one. Um, I have uh, considered uh, your, your preview material and I, I want to ask you, um, which is the effect to change uh, the layer thickness in your multi-layer model? Yeah, so, so what that goes into is one of the main assumptions which we're working on modifying because right now it's a, it's a, it's a pretty simplistic approach, but it gets us within about uh, five to 6% of our experimental results. And so what we're doing is we're assuming that all those longitudinal layers are taking the axial loading. And then the inner layers are only taking shear as a function of um, the shear stress. And so as you get thicker with that, two things happen. One is that um, you start to get some actual interlocking between the members, even though they're not side glued. And then the other thing that you have to take into consideration is you get shear, rolling shear failures as you start to thicken those out. And so at that point, you've, start, you've entered a new failure mode. Um, and so there is a limitation um, really um, at the same thickness. You wouldn't want to go thicker with that. And the good news for that is that when you think about laying up these panels, the, the transverse plies as a structural engineer give me no, no real strength. They're no bang for my buck, right? So there's no practical reason to thicken those plies. In fact, what you'll oftentimes see with these CLT panels is when we go to thin CLT panels, we thin out the transverse plies because the longitudinal plies are doing all the work. But it's a great question um, because that that definitely breaks down one of our fundamental assumptions in the, in the equation. Well, and uh, the second one, very quick, uh, are you going to, uh, to consider also uh, if take place, of course, uh, uh, the lamination effect uh, in your model between layers? Uh, so that, Yes, we are working on that um, in the analytical model. The reason that we're not too concerned with that right now is because um, as you go through the CLT manufacturing process, um, there's a handful of tests that you have to pass. In the United States, our governing standard is PRG320. And there, one of the key things is delamination. And so um, you have to pass a, a, a series of very aggressive tests. And so the, those tests in the standard enforce failure in the wood, not in the adhesive. And so um, while we maintain those delamination um, in, in terms of the analytical model, um, 
again, practically the, the thrust of this is to get something for our design engineers. And that's intentionally not a mode of failure based on PRG3 comments. Well, thank you, Joshua. Uh, thank you again for your uh, very important contribution to, to IWSS. Uh, the next one uh, by uh, Soto, uh, Paoletti, and Meneghetti. Experiment on flexible surface formworks for thin shells. Um, thank you, Amadio, for the introduction. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, so um, this work has been developed during my, my master's and consists of a series of experimental models uh, aiming to gather practical and empirical experience uh, with flexible formworks. Uh, just to introduce the subject, I present here some Brazilian examples of concrete shells which structure efficiency allowed uh, very thin thickness and large free spans, which reflect in material savings and reduction in environmental impacts. Uh, however, the costs involved with labor and material of temporary support systems can reach up to 6% of the structure cost. Uh, being one of the factors that led research to develop uh, alternative framework systems that explore the viability of textile and membrane models. Based, based on how the model is stressed and how the concrete is applied, uh, flexible formworks can be divided in fillet and surface mounts. Considering the construction process, there are four possible families of, of surface mounts reflecting different geometries according to the technique used. Aiming to study different types of flexible mounts, five small scale experiments were carried out using pre stressed and freely hanging membra membranes, grenadating shells with different geometries and construction challenges. In the first experiment, a spherical surface was produced by pneumatically pre stressing a plastic membrane. The mold and the reinforcement were developed with a pattern technique analytically achieved. The final shell remaining five millimeters thickness and presenting some local damages originated from application forces and the molding process. Another model was based on Eisler experiments with, with hanging shells using a cotton textile attached to a wooden frame. The shell was conceived to have a central oculus and did not require padding techniques. The mold remained loose after the casting process, having developed plastic deformations and the finished finish, finish, finish shell surface presented air void due to lack of concrete compaction. In sequence two, anti-classic shells were produced from a mechanically prestressed membrane mold. In the first model, a white cement mortar was applied with polypropylene fibers and superfluous sizer to prevent shrinkage and to improve workability. The average shell thickness obtained was 2.5 millimeters. Uh, for the second application, a cement mortar was shot free on the mound, also with polypropylene fibers. The mortar projection was stopped and achieved half, half of the final thickness at 1.5 millimeters height to place reinforcement and curing of concrete. Both experiments were successful, but the use of shot crete enabled a new range of applications. And in order to test the limits of shot crete casting, a very flexible membrane intensivity sculpture was used as a mold. The casting process was made in two steps. Firstly, a thin layer of a polymer composite was applied, aiming to minimize the mold deformability. The second layer was composed by the same cement mortar used at the previous experiment, and the mold deformed considerably during the second application, causing excessive displacement and cracking around the support points. Uh, so from the, from the tabletop models presented, we could identify some critical aspects regard, regarding the concrete casting process of a shell structure with flexible formworks. A good specification of, of the, the concrete is decisive to the application success. Uh, also, the use of polypropylene fibers to control shrink, shrinkage stresses show it as an efficient solution in the scale we studied. About the casting process, uh, it was noted that it should begin at support boundaries and continue symmetrically. Also, it is important to notice that the final geometry will be highly impacted by the contribution of the first concrete layer. Uh, concluding uh, among the techniques applied, the first-person formwork should uh, 
Pressure reformer showed the best results due to the better control of the model's thickness. And, and, and it is important to notice that the small scale experiments presented here did not provide the challenge of concreting a structure at a relevant scale, covering its support elements as foundations, columns, beyond rings, and also the centering problem that might, that might occur. Those details will be part of a future research involving a firstly a one third scale model of the Memorial dos Povos at Belém do Pará, Brazil. Uh, we acknowledge the support of Brazilian agency CAPS and the company Art Spray. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Murillo. And um, uh, I think that we have a question from Francesco Marmo, please, Francesco. Uh, yes, it's just my curiosity. How do you control the thickness of the, of the mortar? Yes, this, this is a problem in the casting process. Um, with the first, in the first model, we, we used uh, some kind of spacers uh, to control the thickness. But with the projection of the with the shot crit process, the, the thickness was controlled by the operator. So it involves um, a little of uh, ability and, and the experience of the operator of the, the, the machine. And we control with the, uh, and, uh, the, the amount of material applied, uh, uh, weighting, the, the, weighting the material that was applied. So you have just an average information about the thickness. Yes. Not a yes. point plus I, one. When casting, yes. But okay. after we could uh, measure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Murillo, again for the thank presentation. You. I, I don't see. Uh, uh, there is a question by Sigrid, I think. Ah, OK. Oh, sorry. If there is time. Um, I have a question. So um, some of the techniques are like form finding techniques, right? But in real life, uh, for example, the hanging shell, would you cast it hanging and then invert it? I mean, that would be a lot of work. So actually, that was not my question. My question was more related. You mentioned the word uh, reinforcement, but so I understand in your models, there is no reinforcement. But do you have any thought as in if you were to build this at the full scale? Well, so I think I have two questions. One is like the hanging model, like you cannot really turn that upside down, right? So that's one question. So how do you see these techniques being used at the full scale? And the secondly is uh, what about reinforcement? How important is that when you are like doing these experiments? Okay, thank you for the, the question. Uh, for the first part, uh, the, the hanging, uh, either use the hanging, the hanging shell model to, to uh, predict the final shape, the best shape, particular shape of the shell. So uh, I used it here to, to, I used the model uh, to conform the concrete with the hanging shell and, and inverted, uh, inverted after the, the casting process. Uh, it, 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 it could be applied for small pieces or for precast pre uh, pre pieces to concrete a larger structure, but in, in bigger, in larger models, it, would not be possible to concrete the, the entire structure then invert. Um, and the second part was about the reinforcement. Uh, we, we use reinforcement in, in the pneumatic shell and in the, the shot crit uh, saddled membrane. Uh, was a uh, in the uh, was important to to improve this uh, the material strength. Uh, so you use it, uh, um, a textile, glass, glass textile, um, uh, fiber, uh, textile uh, made of, of uh, glass fibers. And the fibers that I mentioned, uh, uh, the polypropylene fibers was used just to prevent shrinkage stresses. Thank you. Well, Thank you so much, Murilo, for the answer, and Professor Adriano for thank you all. And uh, uh, now we can move on uh, to Pastrana and Brun, please, uh, with the paper entitled "A New Roof 
over the engineering courtyard studies on pattern and form. Please. I don't know if uh, uh, Pastrana or, or Brun are with us. It's possible that we, we have not. Can you hear me? Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I see, I, I see Rafael now that is uh, in connection. Rafael, uh, do you hear us? Yes, sorry, I have uh, uh, some technical issues. Can you hear me? You're welcome. Okay, you you can start. I I just introduced you, please. Thank you. Sorry for that. So today I just wanted to. So we are Rafael and Edward, two PhD students from Princeton in the United States, and today I wanted to present to you like our workflow for a design project of the roof, and basically what we want to showcase is the underlying computational design process. So the motivation was to find a ritual roof and we had a brief, which basically told us that we had to construct a shell structure or a ritual structure in the engineering courtyard of Princeton University. And the side dimensions were about 58 by 51 meters. And the second restriction was that the, whatever our design solution was, uh, we couldn't exceed the total existing height of the building surrounding by one meter. So that was about uh, 17.5 meters. Uh, so we looked into some precedents uh, in order to get some inspiration for that. And we wanted to create like this sort of skin that could host uh, some recreational and educational activities underneath. So for example, this is one project by Foster and Partners done at the Smithsonian Museum. And then you could, we could all, we grab inspiration as well from these tree-like structures by Shigeru Ban. So we try to somehow draw parallels and create a tree of engineering life as well, but in Princeton. So for that, we uh, jumped into trying to derive a form that wasn't drawn, but actually found. And we relied heavily in computational, in computational pipeline and we used the Compass framework for that which is an open source uh, Python uh, infrastructure for engineers and architects. I hope that more than one of you have heard of it before. And here you see, I give you a, already a sneak peek into what the final solution or the form finding process was using this methodology, where you can see that using a dynamic relaxation approach, you could have colorful visual and interactive feedback into of the design process. So, Without further, um, further preamble, I just jump into sensitivity study we carry to arrive at our final design solution. So we used a simplified linear model where we used, uh, in red you can see what the support conditions are, so our boundary conditions, and in with the little green arrows pointing, time, pointing downwards, you could see what the load uh, assignments were. Uh, here you see what the response of the structure is after the dynamic relaxation process. And we analyzed three different configurations of patterns or say topologies. The first one was like a typical 90 degrees that I guess like for the majority of us is like the default solution to get started. Then we progress from left to right to a configuration where we flip that grid to 45 degrees. And in a second, I will explain why. And lastly, we applied a subdivision algorithm so that we had we had like a block, like restricted buckling length, so where we had uh, uh, higher compression forces. Uh, and here I just quickly go over some of the results. Here you see what the force distribution is, and of course, because we had existing buildings, what we tried to to minimize is how much of that forces were uh, being transferred to them. So here you see like the 90 degree solution there. Then you see what happens with the 45 degree solutions. And we have like visually at least a more a stressed system or more forces being transferred more efficiently surrounding. But then we still notice that we had some higher forces uh, uh, going on. So we decided to introduce uh, a midpoint so that we had more vertical forces coming to the ground where we could put some 
uh, new foundations and then minimize what we had uh, around. But perhaps visually you can see that we have uh, at the column base very large um, element lengths where we had the higher forces, which of course is no good for for buckling. So then it's this is when the subdivision algorithm comes into play, and then you see that we have like this sort of growing growing pattern that stems from the central foundation where you have more vertical forces and then around you have like the minimal horizontal forces transferred to the existing buildings. Uh, interestingly, we plotted the force, uh, force the total load path of, of the four alternatives. And in this graph, you see that more or less uh, option four, which is the selected one in green, looks a little bit disadvantageous here. But the situation here is that uh, for the first study, we didn't limit the total heights of the of the building or of our found, form found solution. So this one is actually 10 meters higher than what we were supposed to, to derive. So when we apply the constraint, you see that the forces dramatically increase actually in threefold. And this is to find the, the planarized, the, a shallower version of the shell. So when we apply the constraint to all the four examples, we see that the green option, which is the selected one, the, the subdivided one, was actually a reasonable solution to that. And here you see how it looks like when it's when there is a, a thickness applied to it for architectural visualization purposes. Lastly, I wanted to present uh, the planarization routine we, we took uh, to cover the, the grid chill structure. So typically one would say that uh, once you have a form found solution, then you apply a planarization on the structure itself. But instead what we decided to do was to keep the structure intact and then just run the planarization on glass panels themselves. And we were confident about it uh, because we noticed um, there were references in build around that actually used this as a, as a feature and not as a disadvantage. And this is basically the outcome of that routine applied to our design project. And that would be it. Thanks very much. If you would like to know more about the project, you can uh, uh, click on the link or go to the website written there or contact us via email. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much, Rafael, for, for the very nice presentation. Very lovely form and form finding. Uh, please, are there any questions about this, uh, this topic, this, uh, this work? Any questions? Can I have a fast question? Yes. Hi, I wonder. I wonder what what material did you envision to use, Rafael? Uh, yes. So for the for the form finding, we didn't apply a, a specific material. We just used uh, elasticity modulus of, of, a, of a fictitious material, which was hundred newtons, hundred gigapascal. So there was no real material applied to this project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Rafael, for the nice presentation. And we move on uh, due to the time. Uh, we have now uh, Reut Meyer and Bloom uh, with the paper entitled Design of Lightweight Membrane Structures. I think that is Robert. Mm -hmm. Hi, Robert. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to show some of the work that we are on and I'm delighted to point out that of course when we talk about lightweight structures it's about Freyotto and Freyotto always said that we have to dig deep to fly high and you are doing in the moment although there's COVID you are doing a dig deep <laughs> digging into the ground to understand and to learn and therefore I appreciate very much your effort to put all this together. Very good value for every listener and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a small part of it. And I want to point at the film of Simon Chu, my partner in Los Angeles. There's the Freyotto film, you can freely view it on YouTube. So we, we put that on. And of course, when I talk about lightweight structures, my connection to this is from starting from FormFinder, which was a, a PhD work that I did in Berlin with Professor Gründig. And you know, all this, it's all about shapes. And during this, like a four-point sale, which is the most simple shape available, it's like double curvature and 
this double curvature is something that is difficult or was difficult to achieve without a rhino, this grasshopper and all these tools at the time it was developed about in 2001, year 2001. And from this part, we connected Rhino, we connected AutoCAD, Revit, all these tools, we connected together to join architects, engineers, manufacturers, and person that they can go for like this very simple sail shade here, that they can go further and analyze very clearly how the shapes are generated, how Gaussian curvature, how contour lines, cutting pattern, all these details that we developed now, how all these are fit together. And we put all this, this lightweight structure idea because it's efficient, it's about um, providing for the future, low material investment. And to have this all put together, we made um, platforms. And this platform is part of the Rainer Bloom's book. Also Professor Bloom, we researched about I think 40 years on shapes, on geometry, and all this we put together in a platform which is named Membrane Online. So in this Membrane Online platform, you can register if you want, it's for free, of course, and you can use the augmented tools, there will be drawing tools, there will be support aid that people can really focus deeper in this topic. And when we talk about this topic, it's of course that we have now COVID and Freoto taught us that we have to appropriately respond to this new, to this also, to this situation and not use semi-skilled patterns that we repeat. So we need to do something new because now the time is changing. We work online, which is positive in this way because we can be together and we do this with the membrane master. And this lightweight structure is something that is taught here in, in, in Krems in Vienna. And we bring together the most specific persons and experts to focus deeper in this topic. So it's a part-time program. And there is Diana Bloom teaching, Jürgen Hennecke, who was the, the, last, the right hand of Frey Otto, Horst Dürr, who built structures, Simon Chu, my partner as ventures, Vincent Selig from Australia. So a large team coming together in Krems. We have a light laboratorium. So the participants come from all countries. So they are like a team. And we also, we not only just meet together in Krems, we also go to building site like this stadium, the Munich stadium here that we visited. And I want to show in this presentation two projects, very short ones, an umbrella that was like something that was based on the ITK from Stuttgart with Julian Dinhardt a bending active element that was used to increase the power of an umbrella. And this umbrella is like something that we really have in a 3D geometry, not flat surfaces. That means lightweight needs, needs curvature. Curvature is our friend. And when we have this shape ready, we also need to have this shape on the real place in reality. Because if you want to show this, shape to someone, you can use tools which are also in the membrane online that you can position an object in 3D because lightweight structures are curved and having curved structures, it's always difficult to position these structures and to commit the client to realize it because the drawings, they don't provide all sufficient information in 3D because they are 2D. And therefore we made many tools that should support so all these tools are helping to promote membrane structures. If you position this umbrella, you can rotate it, you can view it. So this part will also be part of the Bloom book. So in the book, we have hundreds of shapes and these shapes you will be seen in 3D. So you can rotate those shapes, you can open them. So this is the umbrella, like a prototype that we built. It's about 12 meter size. You can use augmented tools to position them and this is something that is like visibility. We want to show membrane structures. The next thing is, which is the, the second project, is like a full climate building envelope. We did a small structure in Germany to prove that this technology works. And it is, of course, difficult to do such a project the first time. All these details were developed by hand. So the people were standing there and thinking, how can we fix this? How can we organize this? This has, of course, huge disadvantages when you do this the first time. But 
the idea and the concept behind this is very futuristic and therefore we improved this technology further. Now we did this a small workshop in Italy, in Accumuli, which is online also. And all this is like, like membrane online, bringing the world together with the passion and the idea on lightweight structures. And if you have a membrane, which is highly efficient, like a small film that has an insulation power of a normal wall, of an insulated wall, you can really think about building lightweight structures made of efficient, ecologic, um, like really performant materials. And this is what our goal is. And I'm very happy to share this idea and passion with you. And thank you very much for letting me show you these ideas. <laughs> thank you very much, Robert. Very, very impressive and nice, nice presentation. And also with uh, augmented reality for, for, the, you. for your project. Um, are there any questions, please, that we can uh, uh, pose to Robert? No question? Uh, I have um, uh, a curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. a curiosity. Uh, do you have uh, any collaboration with um, universities? Oh, yes. Yeah, the, the master's program itself is, of course, with, uh, Vienna, uh, with the Krems University. I'm teaching at the Vienna University of Technology, and I'm also teaching at several universities, like, a, like small guest professorships, like workshops <laughs> back together in a week or something. And there's, I think this platform is, it should be more academic. There should be more people like profiting from this knowledge because there are hundreds and thousands of projects that we collected. And I think myself, I was, involved is, is too big, but I was I was part of very small homeopathic part of about thousand projects. There are stadium roofs, there are large train stations, airports. And my part is a very small part, the form finding part in the beginning with the architect. This is very small and the materialization also help sometimes. That means my involvement is very wide with many people. And then engineering offices are taking over the project, like from the LEF group, all these, these offices who can really elaborate the project. They have the 99.9% .9 of the time investment in such a project because then they have to sit and to do the thing. And I'm initiating the things. That means I'm starting the project. I'm helping people who, who want to dig deeper in this topic. And I think the future of building is in lightweight structures in combination with sustainable material like wood. Because membrane in the moment is not that sustainable because the new material that we develop now in the moment, this will really be ecologic, like eco-bio, like <laughs> what the people always talk, because it has, they do very often greenwash things. They say, this is, this is green and this is very good, but it's not. If you really dig deeper and you focus on the topic, then you find out that not, not everything that the people are providing on the market is sustainable. And so my focus is really to provide something which is good for the nature, good for our environment and beautiful to look at because all the things we do, they are pleasing our eyes because we want to improve the quality of our living. We want to improve our built environment and membrane and wood is one way to achieve this. And so this, if this should, we should put in many heads. This is um, something that I want to promote. Fascinating, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, we you. have uh, another question from Andrea Micheletti. Please, Andrea. Um, yes, uh, it's just a, a curiosity. Again, uh, if you need to uh, predict the dynamical behavior or in these projects, or, or maybe you take mm -hmm. care of it, but just with some criterion uh, to increase, make it stiffer, or um, mm -hmm. just, just about this, mm -hmm. this aspect. So, I understood the question that you want to know for like dynamic loads or wind loads and or snow loads. Yes, if you need to predict the natural frequencies in, in your tools, the, the, mm. or maybe you just make it use some general design criterion that you take care of it. Yes, yeah. Um, mo in the moment, I'm working on a habilitation, which is on one, one subtopic is the performance criteria of membrane structures. And these performance criteria, of course, 
inherit dynamic loads. We have different algorithms like the force density to determine the first shape. Then we go deeper, of course, with dynamic relaxation, we, when also with Ruiz algorithms and also different algorithms are used to analyze different behaviors. And then we involve engineers who have a specific experience and expertise in the field. Like we, of course, we use wind tunnels. We, of course, we use the, the um, system analyzing tools that support each project. And we involve in the beginning many people. We want to bring together intelligent people like a good engineer, engineer woman or man, and a good way to, to make all this is to bring experts in the position where they can evolve and where they can grow. That means every person, like in the master's program, the goal is that every person becomes the most experienced expert in this field, what he or she is in. That means if you have an engineer, then this person should know more about the engine than anyone else. If you have a designer, he should or she should be the most passionate person in this field. And if you achieve this, you can join together a team that can solve everything. And this is the goal of the master's program and the goal of this teaching life with structures, because you have worldwide people who are enthusiastic, who want to do positive things and they are here. We can, we can bring them into a position where they can elaborate where they can grow and this can make a better world because this is the key to it's success. Very good, uh, it's very good ambition uh, and proposal. Thank you much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Robert, again. A pleasure. It's, it's a good, good honor and I appreciate very, very much your effort in doing this and as you. Uh, okay, now um, we move on to the, to the last presentation for this session and mm -hmm. for the day. Uh, the authors are Di Trapani, Malavisi, Marano, and Sberna. And the title of this work is Genetic Algorithm-Based Optimization of RC Frame Structures Retrofitting with Steel Jet. I think that the presenter is Fabio. Yes, uh, I will share the screen. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, thank you uh, to all for attending. Uh, the name of this work is Algorithm Based Optimization RC Frame Structure with Steel Ducketing. Uh, it is based on uh, uh, an attempt uh, to uh, minimize the cost of retrofitting intervention when we are dealing with uh, uh, retrofitting, uh, seismic retrofitting of frame structures. Uh, as you know, uh, when we want to decide some um, uh, strategy for intervention, we can move towards tactility increase or strength increase. And by the way, we have uh, several opportunities to, uh, uh, of retrofit methods for structure. Uh, the other possibilities is base isolation and in base isolation, you will, will change the demand. As you can see, you will switch from the, uh, the green line to the dashed line that you can see below. Um, let me set the pointer, okay. Um, so uh, the optimization goals in this case are trying to minimize the cost of these interventions because uh, uh, at the same time is we minimize the cost, we are going to minimize also uh, the number of the elements that we are uh, reinforcing. And in this way, we are trying to minimize the uh, downtime for the structures, okay. so. Uh, I will show an application on steel jacketing of probably this is not exactly uh, uh, the, in the, the theme of uh, our on this conference, but uh, I would like that you see this as an application that we can move uh, uh, eventually with other retrofitting systems and to other typologies of structures, such as the one related to this conference. Okay, what are the problems of uh, steel jacketing? It, these are a very invasive techniques. So what we want is that to reduce as much as we can the amount of uh, retrofitted elements, and we want to uh, 
reduce the downtime for the building. Because of this, the engineering optimization problems is fundamental in this case. So what we propose is a, a genetic algorithm of procedure in which we model the structure in an OpenSys framework. And the OpenSys structure is controlled by MATLAB and by a genetic algorithm uh, framework, which uh, uh, minimizing the retrofitting costs will uh, provide us the final position. So there is a topological optimization of the position of the columns to be retrofitting and the minimum spacing uh, of uh, uh, the buttons that we have to use. Uh, I don't go into details on gen genetic algorithms because uh, I know that uh, most of you are expert on these. Uh, so our case study is a traditional RC frame, but is a RC frame that is uh, uh, basically not seismically designed. We have modeled this in open this fiber section uh, for space elements, uh, and we have assigned some um, stress strain models, uh, we have defined some uh, stress strain laws for taking into account the confinement action by uh, the um, jacketing. And uh, at the end, we have defined the probable most uh, uh, likely design space. So we have, in order to reduce the design space, we're searching these possible elements. We are uh, um, restricting the design space into the first two floors. And uh, within the first floor, uh, uh, we, have, we are defining the dimension of the angles, we are defining uh, the day thickness, and um, our algorithm will say us where to locate the retrofitting and which space in uh, uh, the buttons we have. Okay, and so uh, basically we define a, a design vector, and in that design vector you have uh, some binary variables. So this means that we have zero. Uh, this means that uh, the column is not reinforced. The one means that the column is reinforced. Okay. Uh, so these are Boolean va va variables. While uh, uh, the first variable is the spacing of, of the steel. So uh, and so uh, the procedure will start generating several uh, several. Uh, the population of a different uh, uh, random population of elements. Uh, each element is uh, uh, tested by the pushover analysis and the, the uh, capacity demands ratio is evaluating, evaluating if uh, uh, the element, the, 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 um, uh, each, ele each uh, element is feasible or unfeasible. Uh, the, Objecting function is then uh, built, and the objecting function will take into account the workmanship cost and also the cost related to the weight of this of what steel. We also define a penalty functions which penalizes uh, the, the individuals which are not feasible. In this case, these elements are uh, elaborated by MATLAB, uh, analyzed by OpenSeas. Each element is evalu uh, as its evaluation of uh, the capacity to band ratio. And finally, we get uh, a convergence of uh, several, after several generation, we have a convergence up to the optimal uh, solution, which is uh, uh, the one presenting the lowest cost, as you can see in this semi-logarithmic space. And uh, at the same time, we are exploiting at the maximum possible the capacity of the materials because we are moving to a lower uh, capacity demand ratio close to one. Okay, in this case, it's a very simple case. We can find that the retrofitting columns to uh, the columns to retrofit are on, uh, only the one aligned uh, at the center and the column at the top. And there are some um, uh, differences in cost. Uh, as you can see, if I try to retrofit both the first two story, I'm going to spend about 50,000 euros. Uh, at the end, uh, I'm going to spend with my optimized solution, I'm going to spend about 16,000 uh, 16, euros. Uh, and finally, uh, we can see uh, that, uh, of course, this is um, an application of, of a method that um, based on a strategy that can be applied to 
any uh, frame, I think, structural typologies. And uh, the advantages is that we can locate uh, the um, retrofitting at some points uh, and uh, we can just retrofit what we need. And uh, in, this way, in this way, we can minimize the cost of the intervention and also the time, downtime for the extraction, okay? Uh, for more details, uh, this is a paper related to this work. And thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, attending. Well, thank you for, for I try to stay in five, six, five, six minutes. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I was very in a hurry. Don't worry. This this session is special, I think, <laughs> from this point of view. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I think that Francesco um, has a question for you. Yes, thank you for the presentation, Fabio. It's amazing how much money you can save by optimization. <laughs> so my... <laughs> My question regards the optimization algorithm. Is there a special reason why you choose a genetic algorithm and not a traditional optimization algorithm? Uh, well, uh, it is uh, the one that we, uh, I, 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 it is very uh, easy to be uh, implemented in MATLAB because as you can see, we have a design vector um, I cannot find the design vector shape. Uh, so as you can see, we have a design vector uh, and this design vector are, represent the single columns and these columns have zero or one if they are reinforced or, are reinforced or, or not. Of, uh, this is very suitable for the topological optimization using a genetic algorithm because it is just in the shape of a vector uh, and, and in which I can uh, make some operations of uh, uh, mutation and crossover and uh, it will change uh, by several, um, by changing the, the, going ahead with the different population, uh, the, individuals going to towards the, the best one and uh, uh, I think that is the most suitable way uh, using a genetic algorithm to uh, try to solve this problem because it is a discrete problem it is not a continuous problem and in this way uh, the genetic algorithm can help us in uh, solving this uh, the fact that this is a discrete problem and the fact that this is a Boolean problem, zero, one, okay? Okay, thank you. I hope that it is uh, enough uh, for us it, as an answer. It, it is a good reason to choose it. Uh, it was, a, uh, maybe it was an exam or a question. <laughs> I, I was joking, Francesco, because we are very... Yes, yes. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, we have another question uh, from Stefano. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Fabio. It's very interesting. And uh, uh, as Francesco also mentioned, that uh, you have a big reduction uh, of costs. And um, I don't know how much big or uh, if you uh you select why you selected this kind of building as a benchmark but uh so uh to put these kind of things in application for which kind of structures you do you think could be oriented this kind of optimization i'm thinking i was thinking about school buildings or strategic structures I, i'm not sure that nowadays it could be affordable for a, for instance a private condo or things like this or do you think it's possible uh, uh, so you mean that it is not affordable for private customers that want to make some seismic retrofitting of uh, oh it depends building? maybe for a big condo maybe six Yes, I know. Uh, in fact, this is a this is a very small structure. We start with this because we have to uh, try to have some control of the results of the structure. So, for we we could not start with a very complex structure. This is the first work we are doing on these, but we are uh, 
just uh, already working on some uh, uh, complications, for example, including uh, shear verification and shear verification to the, to, to the additional demand from measuring fields. Uh, I think that this kind of approach is good when you have uh, a structure that is big enough uh, and uh, to save uh, uh, several money. Uh, uh, because, for example, as you told, strategic structures or very uh, structure which has uh, uh, a lot of columns, not like this one, but uh, imagine, for example, that we have a building with uh, 100 columns per, per story, you can have a big uh, economical uh, save. And uh, by the way, uh, the idea is try to develop such uh, strategies to um, have the opportunity in a uh, future, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe 10 years, I don't know, and uh, try to see if maybe this uh, uh, optimization uh, uh, algorithms could be implemented in some traditional codes that we use to design instruction, to design retrofitting intervention. And also uh, there is another uh, important issue that is related to the uh, um, computational times, uh, because uh, you have not an answer in uh, 10 minutes, you have an answer in uh, some hours for this kind of building. And uh, uh, if the structure becomes more complex, so for example, if you want to consider both two direction for earthquake, and uh, you will spend more time. But I think if, for example, it's, uh, you have a 1,000 euro uh, 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 intervention cost, and then you save, for example, 30%, uh, this could be a good compromise uh, for, uh, uh, for the customers and, and also for uh, the other um, people. It's for, for, the, um, for the government also uh, that is investing on uh, retrofitting interventions for uh, strategic buildings. Uh, but yes, because of course you have to add to this kind of cost also the seismic assessment and uh, the, of the structure before understanding if you need uh, uh, retrofitting or not. Yes, but and another thing that uh, the another possible approach is uh, sometimes is that uh, we uh, actually don't, don't know exactly what to retrofit. So also uh, eventually uh, running these with only one direction in the most uh, simplified way can help uh, us, can help the designer to start to, can give a, a suggestion to the design. Of course, the final decision is up to the engineer, but uh, this could give you, you uh, an idea, okay, uh, of what you, you can do even starting this uh, into uh, not complete op optimization of everything, okay? Okay, thank you. The, I think this topic is very interesting for uh, civil protection purposes and uh, society. More. Yes, it is. Uh, we are starting work a lot, working a lot of, on, uh, on this and uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of paper in the past were, were done, uh, for example, for optimization of uh, dampers, for example, but uh, uh, not very much on uh, retrofitting systems. So now we are trying to move to fiber enforced polymers, for fiber enforced uh, FRP, for example, and uh, nothing, completely nothing about optimization of retrofitting on measuring structures that are even more complex to, to individuate the, um, the walls to retrofit because uh, when you retrofit a wall, you attract more force. So you make a reinforcement in that wall at the, and you start again. So for measure optimization could be very important to, to carry it out to save money and have uh, maximum exploitation, exploitation of materials. Thank you, thank you, Fabio. Well, thank you. Um, any other question? Okay, I want to, to, to thank again Fabio for, for the presentation. Very nice, thank you again. 
and uh, uh, was the last paper, the last work. So I want to thank again all the presenter and the speaker. I, I want to thank also our keynote, Professor Lagaros. Uh, it was a very full and um, rich session uh, for this day. Uh, like in uh, traditional way, the, the last but the least session, of course. So uh, we can see tomorrow, we can see tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock a.m. Uh, in the Central Europe uh, summer time, of course, uh, 9 a.m. in Italy. And uh, if uh, are not any other questions, any other comments, I want to uh, give you my greetings and we see we see tomorrow morning. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Thank but you so tomorrow, much. For tomorrow, tomorrow we will guys. start Thank 90. You right? For organizing this workshop. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Question about the starting time tomorrow. Is it, is it 9 or 9.15? I guess according to the plan, yeah. it's 9.15. Uh, for, the program, for the program, uh, we will have the starting and setup session at 9.15. Okay, fine. So the, 